So during the Gilded Age, laborers were doing really bad. But they probably weren't doing as bad as farmers. And this is really important because during this period, farmers are still a majority of the population. And this is when farmers will start experiencing the problems that they have had ever since. Agriculture has had a problem since the 1870s that has not gone away. And farmers will get angry and they'll organize into what's called the populist party, or the populist movement. This is where the, we get the word populist in our vocabulary. You know, now every election, the candidates want to be the populist candidate or the people's candidate. This is where this starts. Well, the term populist starts. Fundamentally, what is going on here, and this is important for you to know, is an economic process called creative destruction. It's also called Schumpeter's Gale after uh, Joseph Schumpeter, his economist that came up with the term. Basically what this means is in every capitalist society where there's innovation and change, there are going to be winners and losers. So there is a new technology, there's innovation, and it acts as a disruptor to society. And when that happens, there are always people that do better, and then there are always people that do worse. So the examples that we have been talking about in this class, like railroads, obviously great for the majority of the population, but if you are uh, well, like cowboys, totally destroyed the need for cowboys. Um, the uh, carriage industry, horse and carriage, uh, that obviously starts a major decline with railroads and then with cars. So there are always parts of the population that are left behind when there's a technological change. And uh, it's true today too. Uber and Lyft have really hurt people who drove taxis. Airbnb has hurt the uh, hotel industry. You know, Amazon has really hurt retail stores and malls, especially. So all of these, all of these changes are generally good, but for individuals, they are really, really difficult. And the greater the pace of change, the more people are left behind. Uh, that is why there are always people, when this happens, when creative destruction is taking place, there are always people that try to stop it. They're called the Luddites. Uh, it's a term for people that used to destroy machines, starting with like spinning wheel, uh, spinning wheels for like cotton, for turning cotton into shirts. And uh, yeah, there are people that destroyed them because they're destroying the jobs. So when this happens, there are always people that are trying to stop it from happening. And there are people that are being left behind economically. And they, every time this happens, there are people that, that will say, we need to go back to the past. And so the greater the amount of change, the more people uh, freak out. And so right now we're living through one of the biggest periods of change. Chat GPT is supposed to disrupt like 40% of all jobs, supposedly. Uh, it is really changing everyone's life. Uh, that is also what's happening in the 20th century. And that is what's happening with farmers. The economy is changing and they're being left behind because fundamentally their problem is you cannot grow cotton, for example, in a manufacturing based economy and still be doing well. So agriculture as a whole during this period, it looks like it's doing great. Because if you look at the big numbers, how much cotton is being produced in the United States? How much is it worth? You know, it's massive numbers. And so the amount of farmers, the amount grown, they were huge and they look good, especially compared to other countries. But the problem is you can't be a farmer in a society where they're making steel and you know, inventing electricity and advanced manufacturing and make a living. So compared to the rest of society, farmers are falling behind economically. That is their basic problem. 
is they're being left behind economically. Now, obviously, that's a macroeconomic problem. And so uh, that's also a problem with them as individuals. They would have to look inside and say, what am I doing wrong? Uh, I'm falling behind. I should get an education, something like that. But humans generally don't do that. So no creative destruction because it is a big reason for a lot of people losing their minds today. Is they, people that are, you'll be able to see from now on, there are people that are trying to stop uh, the techno, technological and economic revolution and you just can't. It's never been done effectively. There's been delays, but never stopping it. So that's farmers basic problem fundamentally and they were really generally doing bad farmers were doing incredibly bad make sure to read about this in your textbook it's on the section about reconstruction but very generally after the civil war when slavery was ended in the south obviously the landowners still needed labor so they started relying on what are called tenant farmers and sharecroppers. These are people that do not own the land and will work that land for the landowner. Now, they ended up getting in debt cycles because they would have to borrow money so they could live and they would promise a store, for example, that they would pay back the money when their crop came in, which is going to be about a year later. And that is what the crop lien system is. Again, make sure to read about this. But this is what agriculture, especially in the South, became based on. It is more and more people, more and more farmers, started losing, uh, started losing their land for, to foreclosure and started uh, becoming tenant farmers and sharecroppers. And this happened to a bigger, bigger part of the population. And so, partly because of this, and well, it's cause and effect. Railroads are a big reason for this. So if you're a tenant farmer, sharecropper, you're working a lot of land, what does that landowner want to plant? A staple crop like cotton that's going to earn them money. And especially since they have the railroad that's now coming through there, uh, that they can sell to cities, bigger markets, that's basically all they're growing. So more and more of agricultural economy is getting based on staple crops, you know, rather than uh, family farms growing your own stuff, more and more Americans, f American farmers are becoming totally dependent on staple crops because of the railroads. And obviously the railroads are giving them opportunity for a better life, but being dependent on staple crops, it's a problem because that is an international market. So something that happens in Europe will affect cotton prices. That's true of all international markets, is that there's stuff happening beyond our borders that explain changes in prices. And with, when you're growing staple crops, that is especially true. It's also true of oil. That's why if you want to know someone, if someone just has no idea what the hell they're talking about, if they say presidents control oil prices, that's how you know they have no idea what they're talking about because it's an international market. And there's, uh, the United States doesn't even control it. No company controls oil prices. It's based on a bunch of complex factors. The really important thing to remember about this is this was both blacks and whites. So obviously the former slaves, they were really poor and they were becoming sharecroppers, especially. And that is understandable because they had been former slaves. They had no money, they had no land, but poor whites were also becoming tenant farmers and sharecroppers. So poor whites are now losing their land and the poor whites are becoming on the same socioeconomic level as blacks. And that is so important to know because during this period, after reconstruction, after the black codes, there will be a period where poor blacks and poor whites will be socioeconomically similar. When slavery existed before the Civil War, if you were poor white, no matter how poor you were, you were still socioeconomically 
better than a black because you were free. You weren't a slave. During this period, blacks and whites will start having the same socioeconomic status. And that'll change when Jim Crow laws are passed, that they spe are especially passed in the 1890s. And so there'll be a couple decades where poor blacks and poor whites, for the only period I know of in US history, will work together on a massive scale politically. There have been obviously other cases of uh, uh, poor blacks and poor whites working together, but not like this, not to this scale. So it is really important to understand tenant farming and sharecropping. So make sure to read about that in your textbook. If you saw the picture, one, if you really go into the details of what it was like to be a tenant farmer and sharecropper, it was awful for everyone. Uh, the, a lot of these pictures are from the 1930s. Uh, there was a photographer that, for the, it's called Rural, uh, Rural Administration, that went out and took pictures of all of the lives of these people. And it was like they lived in a third world country. The level of poverty in Southern society with, uh, among tenant farmers and sharecroppers was just horrifying. Like they didn't have running water in a lot of places up until 1930. They didn't have electricity. And by 1938, this is a picture from 1930, uh, 1937, 1938, uh, one third, a quarter or one third of Southern children didn't own a full pair of clothes. I mean, the level of poverty is is very hard to understand to believe but it was really bad throughout the south up until the 1930s so this is the problem that will haunt agriculture to this day and it was due to a lot of factors obviously as we just mentioned there's a big socioeconomic factor which is the second industrial revolution you cannot be growing an agricultural product well the, and be competing with the other industries. So relative to the other industries, it's not doing as well, which means uh, it's which means farmers are falling farther and farther behind. So that's their basic reason. Uh, another problem was overproduction. So if you're an individual farmer, how do you get more money? You grow more. And this isn't even something that farmers can really control because all you do is you plant as much as you can on your land because you don't know if there's going to be a drought or something. Uh, so their only way you can be make more money is to grow more. Now, if everyone's growing more, what does that mean? It's going to produce too much and the prices will go down. So that was a huge part of farmers' problems is they were just producing too much. And there's, it is an insane, it sounds like it might be an easy problem to fix, but it's insanely difficult. The other, those two problems are like, one's macroeconomic, so mo hard, mo hard, difficult for most people to understand. Uh, overproduction, that is the fault of the farmers. And are they gonna blame themselves? No, because and nothing against farmers, it's a human thing. So uh, that was something that, you know, there's not a really good solution for. The big one for them, was transportation costs and railroads. And this is so important to know for your essay. Uh, for your essay, they were on very solid footing with this one. Railroads were just insanely corrupt during this period, and there was no law stopping them. So they would do all sorts of things that are illegal now. The big one for farmers, though, was they would jack up their prices. Because let's say you're a farmer in, you know, rural Texas somewhere, and obviously you have to use the one rail line. You know, if you're in a rural area, there's only one line going through there. Uh, and so you only have one choice. So it's not like you can choose which price you want. And so use a hypothetical example. You're a farmer growing cotton, and the price of cotton is 10 cents for every 100 pounds. And... All of a sudden, 
something happens over in Europe and the price of cotton goes up to 14 cents every 100 pounds. So as a farmer, this is phenomenal for you. You're about to make more. Well, what the railroads would do is they would keep their eye on this also and they would jack up their prices by four cents. So they would take all of the farmer's ability to have a profit. And if you're a farmer, you have to use the railroad. There's no other option for transportation that is reasonable. And so they basically had no option. It's one of the areas that is absolutely unequivocal. Railroads were just really, really destroying farmers' ability to have a profit. And so that was a big one. Another big issue was tariffs. We've talked about this before. Tariffs, uh, they're the number one source of revenue for the federal government until 1916, when we get the very first progressive income tax in a time of peace. We passed them in times of war, but uh, that's why tariffs were talked about so much back then. And just to remind you, if a tariff is great for businesses because it stops foreign goods from coming in, but it's bad for the majority of the population because it means all prices are going to be raised. Like that is one of the causes we had inflation for a few years. One of the reasons, because it was really complicated, was tariffs. We had tariffs raised and that always leads to inflation because that's what it's supposed to do. It increases prices. So farmers, they hated this. And Democrats have been against tariffs for you know, since before Jackson. So it was a regional thing. High cost of credit. Uh, I'm not going to go into this at all. Just the banking system in the United States was a complete disaster. We, Andrew Jackson got rid of the second bank of the United States, so we didn't have a central bank. So uh, loans were insanely difficult. Farmers can only get loans for 12, 13%, which that's way too much for, for a farmer. Uh, it, they can't pay that much. And also, obviously, they need a long time. So farmers complained about the high cost of credit. Now, the single biggest issue, and the biggest issue in the 1880s and 1890s is the monetary system. And this is very complicated, so I'm going to keep it very short and very simple. The monetary system is the amount of money in excuse me, the amount of money in circulation. So the amount of money the government is using in circulation. And this was also a disaster during this period. I won't go into it, but there's all sorts of currencies floating around. It was it was a, just a mess. That's because we didn't have a central bank. The monetary system was as a, a disaster, and it was especially bad for farmers. And it's because we were in a period of what's called deflation. Now, you know this hypothetically, but you've never experienced, well, we've all experienced this, but it was so minor that it wasn't even a blip on the radar. 2008, in November, December, uh, during the financial collapse, we had a period of minor deflation. And before that, the last time we had significant deflation, in U.S. history was 1947. It was after every war, the economy has to readjust. And so there are very few people alive that have experienced deflation. Deflation is when the price of goods and services are going down. Now, during this period, we had a lot of deflation. And what that means for farmers is if you're a farmer, then you uh, say you take out a loan for $100 and you have to pay back that loan and you're selling cotton and cotton goes from 10 cents a pound or 10 cents, 100 pounds. And the next year, it's nine, uh, eight and a half cents, eight cents, seven cents. That's what deflation is. The price of goods and services going down. So deflation is terrible for farmers. And deflation was really, really bad during this period. Why was deflation so bad? Because the United States was what's on, what's, it was on what's called the gold standard, not officially and legally, but every dollar that the US government sent out had to be backed by gold. Uh, it's called, that's what the gold standard. So if you have $20, you go to the, you go to the government bank, you say, I want gold. They'd have to redeem it for gold. This is where the saying as good as gold comes from. 
because the amount of money in circulation is based on gold, obviously the amount of gold doesn't drastically change. So it means the money supply is going to be incredibly, incredibly limited. And so that is why there was deflation because the amount of money wasn't increasing, but the amount of goods being produced was greatly increasing. So gold, the amount of money stayed the same. That is why there was deflation. So what do farmers want? Inflation. They want the price of goods and services to go up. Why do they want, uh, if the price goes up, then obviously they'll be able to sell their goods for more, so they'll be able to pay off their debts. Now, deflation or inflation is good for minor inflation. You want inflation as a country. You want it to be around 1% or 2%. That is healthy. Uh, that is a healthy inflation rate. So you want inflation, but uh, inflation isn't good for everyone. Who is inflation bad for? The people that are lending the money. So basically banks and the super rich, they would rather have deflation. Price of goods and services is going down and uh, it's bad or it's good for people with money. And I'll explain this with an example. So let's say we all live in a country and it's called, we'll call it David Topia for this example. It's okay to live in. It's fine. Uh, there are a hundred of us and in this country we have a hundred people, we have a hundred dollars and we all have our jobs and there is, you know, everything's fine. And then over the span of 30 years, we increase the population of Davidopia from a hundred people to 300 people. And then we increase the amount of goods that are being produced by five or 600, 700, 800% because that is how much of an increase there was in a, a lot of agricultural products uh, and like steel and stuff like that. So the amount of people is increasing, the amount of goods is increasing, but we only have a hundred dollars in that room still, or in this little country. Based on the laws of supply and demand, what does everyone want then? They want that money. That is what causes deflation. Everyone wants the money, so the price of money itself is going up and the price of goods and services is going down. That's why rich people and banks like deflation because it's good for them because they have the money. Inflation is uh, better for farmers and better for people that are making products. Now, obviously today we have inflation by just printing up money willy nilly. And you know, we print up millions and millions a day of new money, and it's not backed by anything. But back then, they thought all money had to be backed by something. So, how do you increase the amount of money in circulation? Silver. That is the answer they came to. Instead of all money being backed by just gold, have it backed by gold and silver. And obviously, silver will never be worth as much as gold. So. It, it, it was like 16 to one in terms of the rate price ratio. And that is what farmers would want. This is the biggest issue of the 1880s and 1890s. I'm not going to ask you to explain every, all that. I promise you just know that farmers want inflation. And the way they would want to get it is free silver. They want the government to back all money by both gold and silver, which would greatly increase the amount of money in circulation increase the monetary system and it would lead to inflation. That is, so that is farmers' big issue during this period.